We're talking about Amy's ordeal at the University of Pennsylvania, where she's been, as it were, brought up on charges before the faculty senate at the impetus of her dean at the law school at the University of Pennsylvania for conduct unbecoming, so to speak, of a a professor. And uh, the sanctions are uh, very significant, Amy. They, they, it's as if they are hoping that you'll retire. Uh, I, I don't want to get ahead of us. Do you want to just uh, tell us what's going on uh, with you at uh, Penn and uh, what the resolution is and how you're feeling about it? Okay. Well, just very briefly, uh, these charges were brought. They kept adding different charges, I think, because they knew that most of the allegations related to my so-called extramural speech, speech outside the school. So they they uh, sort of combed the record and trolled me and found some students who made allegations uh, which are completely false and distorted of something I said 13 years ago at a reception. There were all sorts of uh, charges. I won't go into the details. Um, and they had a hearing for three days in May. Uh, it was really uh, a kangaroo court, like uh, you wouldn't believe. I, I could give you some of the anecdotes from the hearing. Then the uh, hearing board, the Senate hearing board, faculty Senate hearing board, issued a decision, which I sent to you, which is an absolute shambles, of course, uh, as we've agreed. Uh, and then I appealed it to Liz McGill, now the deposed president, who gave it just a very superficial rubber stamp even though it violated every known principle of academic free expression and free speech, didn't matter. And now it's on the final stage of appeal at Penn before a committee, the Committee on Academic Freedom and Responsibility. It's been sitting there for almost five months now. Uh, the appeal happened to be filed a week before October 7th. So October 7th uh, was a little bit of a blow up, obviously, because it brought all these pro Palestinian yeah. protesters to campus and all these allegations of anti Semitism. Uh, excuse so me, nothing excuse has me for interrupting, uh, Amy, but I, I just want to read just a little bit from the summary of the of the committee's uh, letter of finding uh, in your case. Uh, right. The the decision was supposed to be confidential until there was a final decision by Penn on appeal. That's what they asked, and I was complying with that. Um, and then someone, I don't know who, leaked the hearing board decision to uh, the press, to the school newspaper. Um, okay. So that's how it got out. Okay, so it's out. So we're not violating any privacy by uh, just reading no. briefly. We find that Professor Wax repeatedly violated professional norms by presenting topics in reckless disregard of scholarly standards and presenting misleading and partial information, which is often not scholarly or peer-reviewed, in order to draw sweeping conclusions with the predictable impact of negatively and inequitably harming the learning environment at the University of Pennsylvania. That's quite a sentence. And secondly... <laughs> Violating widely held standards of privacy and confidentiality by discussing her perceptions of pin carry law student grades by racial groups. And third, repeatedly and persistently making discriminatory and disrespectful statements to specific targeted racial, national, ethnic, sexual orientation and gender groups with which our students and colleagues identify. Her behavior has created a hostile campus environment and a hostile learning atmosphere. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, just to get on the table, what it is that they have found that you are guilty of having done. It seems to me that one driving force here is our students feel unsafe in Wax's presence. We must protect them. Hostile learning environment, hostile environment for the campus. Uh, another thing here is uh, she's talking out of school. So this business of privacy, if, if you have made the statement in uh, our conversations here in the past, that on, on your observation, uh, black students didn't do as well academically in the law school classes as uh, they uh, might have done. They were clustering at the bottom. You said something words to that effect. They're saying you violated the student's privacy by making racial generalizations based on your experience, irregardless of whether or not what you said was factually accurate, because uh, it creates an environment in which the students fear that inferences will be made about them as individuals from the fact that they belong to a group that you 
characterized on your experience as not doing so well. So what do you say about that? Well, first of all, that privacy argument, okay, was made long ago. It is contestable based on the actual standards in the law. So let's get that on the table and very clear because I did not name individual students. I made generalizations about groups, okay? So there's a very strong argument that that is no privacy violation at all. Well, that's a technical legal argument. I've already pu been punished for that by having my course taken away from me. And it's a very small tail that's wagging a very large dog, Glenn, because there are multiple other allegations. And for them to just sort of say, well, at the very least, she violated privacy, even if that other stuff is, you know, bullshit, questionable nonsense, uh, that really does not allow this sanction to hold up. I'm sorry. That is not what they said here. Uh, this is a very small part of what they are indicting me for. Let's be clear. They are indicting me for making all sorts of perfectly respectable statements of fact and opinion, which out there in the real world and even in other universities uh, would pass muster, right? So this is, you know, once again, another instance of, of sophistry, I would say. On the hostile environment, um, you know, making us uncomfortable, making us feel unsafe, Glenn, that whole line of argument, that whole set of allegations about student discomfort, student upset, student offense, I'm sorry. You can have free expression and a free exchange of rigorous ideas, or you can have students objecting based on unsafe environment and penalizing professors for unsafe environment, but you can't have both. The two are completely incompatible, right? You have to choose. And this whole shtick of every time a student says they're upset and they complain and they're offended, that shuts down what the professor says and results in a penalty to the professor, right? That you can't have any kind of rigorous truth-seeking function uh, or activity with that threat constantly dangling over your head. We have to get rid of this idea Right? that students uh, can, by invoking their feeling of lack of safety, shut down the discourse. I'm sorry. And I mostly it's too. fake anyway. And it's very selective. It's very selective. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't want to bring up what happened on October 7th, but it's a very big part of our landscape now. And when, okay. when Jewish students feel offended or upset, nobody cares. And I can tell you that when I open the New York Times every morning and feel offended and upset, nobody cares. Right. Well, so, I, 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 would, you know, I we, would I would point out that you can't have it both ways either. You can't have that identity politics and DEI is BS uh, when the uh, students of color invoke it and have it that identity politics is uh, OK and uh, the topic du jour when Jewish students invoke it. I mean, you're well, either. I am not. I don't think that Jewish, I actually am very suspicious of these claims of anti-Semitic upset on campus. I am a free speech absolutist. Why? Because frankly, as they used to say, is it good for the Jews? Is it good for conservatives? Conservatives <laughs> should be very wary of these claims of, you know, uh, offense and lack of safety because it will be turned against them. It will predictably be turned against them as it has been turned against me. So if conservatives want to buy a space in the university or in intellectual discourse, they have to turn away those arguments and say, I'm sorry. And the Supreme Court, you know, the Supreme Court is very wise on these topics. They always get it right. They say that's a heckler's veto. And we cannot allow heckler's vetoes to determine but it is acceptable to say they have been 100% clear on this. And we forget those lessons at our peril.